what do you think is on Johnson's phone? Been asking you all week. I think I think I might know. I think it's going to be full of newspaper editors begging him not to lock down the country because their owners have so much exposure in commercial investment. I think it's going to be full of newspaper editors turning screws and trying to put influence on him. I think it's going to be full of... of uh, who the hell knows what else is likely to be there? Donors trying to get a little bit of the action. I don't know. And nor, of course, do you. And if the government get their way, nor will you ever. Because what happened yesterday is actually incredible. What happened yesterday is that the woman appointed to chair the COVID inquiry received notice that she is being taken to court by the government, albeit with a different prime minister, that appointed her to chair the COVID inquiry in order to resist her demands for access to facts, for access to evidence. That's the crucial word here. Who decides whether it's evidence or not? Not the bloody accused. The judge does. Rishi Sunak, who could be described as the accused in this case, alongside Boris Johnson and the rest of them, they are going to court in order to try to stop evidence being given to the judge leading the investigation, leading the inquiry into COVID. Just pause for a flipping minute and think about that. I shall rein in my inner Jonathan Pye in about 30 seconds' time. But this has really got me, this. Especially because it's bloody Philip Schofield. Everywhere. Being interviewed by a man on the BBC who used to carry bags for Evgeny Lebedev, whose dad is sanctioned in Ukraine, while Boris Johnson dances around the place claiming to still be the saviour. The mind boggles. Truly boggles. Just have a think for a minute about what that means. Imagine, and some people listening to this program, I am acutely conscious, will not need to imagine this. Imagine you'd lost someone and you're still not sure whether you needed to. You're still not sure whether an earlier lockdown or a prime minister bothering to turn up to COBRA meetings or a proper handle upon the facts and the crisis or having somebody other than Matt flipping Hancock in the Department of Health. You still wonder whether if, if things had been dealt with slightly differently, your dad would still be alive. Just imagine that. And then they call the inquiry, right? You think, I don't trust this lot, James. I don't trust them as far as I could throw them. But they've appointed a, they've appointed a solid judge. Baroness Hallett has a really good reputation, just like Sue Gray. I give them benefit of the doubt on this. I th I th they do seem to be genuine in their need, in their desire to see the truth. Baroness, yeah, all right. Well, the Tories have done it. They've called him. Jess Phillips on Question Time last night pointing out that other countries have already finished their inquiries. But hey-ho, we're British. We do things differently. So we've got that. She's it's going to be... Wow. And then Rishi Sunak instructs lawyers to go to court to stop her getting evidence that she wants. How, I mean, how, how many different ways can you phrase those words? How can you rearrange that sentence. Rishi Sunak instructs lawyers to go to court to stop the head of the inquiry into the COVID handling from getting her hands on evidence that she wants. Why? Oh, it's all completely irrelevant. Well, show us then. Prove it. Give us an example, Sunak. What's irrelevant? Johnson pops up like a, an unflushable lump and says, oh, I've handed over all my stuff and I ask the government to do the same. Six hours later, we learn that he hasn't. Six, even by Boris Johnson's standards, that the gap between lie and exposure is vanishingly small. What did I say to you yesterday? He says what's best for him in that nanosecond, not even in the context of 24 hours, but 24 seconds. What's the best thing for me? I'll tell the newspapers, they'll print it anyway. They'll treat it as fact that I have handed over everything and I urge the Cabinet Office to do the same. Fast forward six hours. No, you flipping haven't. You're still hanging on to one of your phones. The phones that covers the most relevant period of this investigation, of this inquiry. Here's a judge. Here is the judge. Here is the evidence. Here is the Conservative government stopping the dog from seeing the rabbit. And Philip Schofield's still on my telly. On a rolling news channel. 
I've started doing something lately. I don't know whether you've noticed, and, I, and, and it's going to backfire horribly one day. I've started to narrow at the very top of the hour the focus on who I want to talk to first. I was toying today with the idea of con confining the conversation early doors to people who voted Tory in 2019, to people who voted for Boris Johnson. How the hell are you handling this? I, I don't mean Idiot's Corner. Right? Idiot's Corner is, oh, I can't believe you're bashing Boris Johnson again. No, nor can I. It's a miracle, isn't it? A, a man who has led the country to the blit, well, not even to the brink of disaster. Why on earth would you be talking about that? An investigation into how thousands of people died, whether or not it was necessary, being actually scuppered by the people who called the investigation. So it's idiot's corner for you. I mean, normal people who, who, who haven't boiled their brains so completely or got so high on Brexit jingoism that they struggle to remember what day it is. You voted for this, this, this man. How the hell do you process the complete collapse in reputation or credibility? I don't know, but that wouldn't be the right. And then I thought, let's confine it to grieving families. Let's talk only to people who genuinely hope that this investigation might shed some light on what happened and why. And then, because I'm a bit mad sometimes, I thought, let's confine it to grieving Tories. Let's confine it only to people who lost someone in the crisis but voted for Boris Johnson, not knowing at the time that this is what would transpire, to be in charge during the biggest peacetime threat this country will hopefully ever face. And then I thought, oh, forget it. Everyone can have a crack today. Everybody's welcome. This is just, just shocking. And there are mornings when I wonder why. I am not the only one by any stretch of the imagination, but there are mornings why I wonder why. It, it, it continues to elude huge swathes of the British media, just how serious the situation that we find ourselves in is. And then I remember that it doesn't. Because almost all of the newspaper editors and their little patsies in, in broadcast media, they're on Boris Johnson. They're not just on Boris Johnson's side. They are Boris Johnson's side. They're his cheerleaders. They spent how many years tickling his tummy and chuckling at his ludicrous jokes and going along with his lies and pretending it's all just a game. Oh, he's having technology lessons off Jennifer R. Curie. Oh, he's such a lad, isn't he? He's such a lad. Yeah, yeah, technology lessons. Mayor of London, public money, forget about it. Tens of millions of pounds on a bridge that was never built. A single brick was never laid. Lies about his mistresses. Lies about his marriages. Lies about his ambitions, his jobs, his performance. Lie, lie, lie. Oh, it's all just a bit of good old Boris. Ruffle hair. Ruffle hair, mug to camera. It's all just a little bit of... They're all in on it. So how the hell can they turn around now and tell you the truth? The people you rely on for the information that you need to enter, enter this country, to engage in the political discourse in this country with even a modicum of knowledge and understanding, they're still lying to you. They sold you this clown. And they torched the receipt. So don't turn to the Telegraph or the Sun or the Daily Mail in search of truth or accuracy or a proper reflection of the seriousness of this situation, because they are in on it. They're not just sitting on their hands or staying out of it. Anybody who's had the uh, ability to interview Boris Johnson on any occasion, let alone several occasions, is completely complicit in this absolute corruption. Completely complicit. How could anybody have got away with so much while being actually quite accessible to the media for so long? Answer, he only ever got interviewed by tummy ticklers. What the hell would I be talking about today on this program if I'd spent the last 10 years tickling Boris Johnson's tummy? I've got absolutely no idea. Probably e-scooters. It's absolutely incredible that the people who thought the investigation, the inquiry might finally shed some light upon what actually happened are now being told by the same government that in instigated the inquiry that we are going to court to keep evidence out of the hands of the judge. Think about that in the context of a criminal case. Here's the accused. All right, we want to have a look at your diaries. No, 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 no. You can't have a look at my diaries. But you're the accused. Yeah, but, uh, but you, you can't have a look at my I mean, crikey. What about my privacy? If you want me to hand over my phone. If you're, a, if, you're an, if you're a victim of rape in this country, they take your phone. It's made available to the prosecution as well as the defence. So the prosecution can go through it looking for evidence that you were, quote, asking for it, end quote. Which still happens in courtrooms in this country. In a criminal case, the accuser has no privacy. But in this case, Rishi Sunak thinks the defence should be able to decide what evidence the court gets to see. Just think about that for 30 seconds. You are the accused. 
and you are so arrogant, so entitled, so used to getting your own way, you honestly believe that you should decide what evidence the court gets to see. You, the accused, get to decide what evidence the court gets to see. Phone a couple of friendly newspaper editors and they'll be writing bilge about how it compromises your privacy. Sarah Vine in the Daily Mail writing bilge about how, oh, one of my emails was once read out on Sky News. Oh, and it was all, it was all tatty-filarious. It was so embarrassing. So I totally believe that Boris Johnson's messages should stay secret. OK, next time someone's on trial for a disgusting crime, you tell me whether they should decide what evidence gets put before the court or whether the flipping court should. It's not normal, this. It's not normal. These are not serious people and their stranglehold upon the flow of information from politics to population is now so complete that Philip Schofield is still on my television right now, right still there, 1017. <sighs> Laura Koonsberg will probably pop up on the telly on Sunday morning. Oh, that's quite a charge. What's happened? Who, who asks questions anymore? Who bothers about the truth?